Sous présidente, euh, vice-présidente exécutive, Madame Vestager, et le commissaire Thierry Breton, sur la logique d'ensemble du paquet et sa dimension économique. Puis, juste après, une deuxième conférence de presse avec Madame Kiriaki de Suasson et euh, Valéan sur les euh, recommandations et orientations plus spécifiques adoptées aujourd'hui par la Commission. Um, Just a technical reminder for all of us, and for you in particular, dear colleagues. Uh, as you know, we've introduced a new system to manage these press conferences. We will continue to pass you the floor. When we give you the floor, your name will turn blue on your screen. You press the speak button, you become red. You speak, and once you've asked your question, please press the button again so that we have no echo in the room. With that, Mrs. Vestager, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it, has been, it has been long and very difficult spring. Uh, key workers in healthcare uh, and other vital services, they have worked tirelessly and selflessly to keep us safe. And we have had to make changes in the way we live our lives to help contain the spread of the virus. But we are slowly starting to emerge from a life beyond lockdown, though not yet a life beyond the coronavirus. Our thoughts are now, I think, turning to summer and maybe even further, and to the places that we love to travel, that be by the sea, the mountains, our cities and our countryside. And those places, they are keen to welcome back travellers. Tourism is a vital part of Europe's economy. Nearly a tenth of GDP across uh, Europe and more than 10% in 11 uh, member states. Millions of jobs depend on tourism. And that often in areas where there aren't many other industries. Tourism gives those regions both uh, security and hope for all that work there. But we have to reintroduce it safely. So this is the first fundamental principles of the packages that we present today. Safety. That underlies our guidance. And that means taking gradual, careful steps to help travel restart in line with what science tells us. The second principle of our guidance is no discrimination. Different countries, of course, are in different situations. But we need to treat Europeans equally. And we all share that responsibility. Governments and businesses, workers and travelers. And the most important thing is that we are open about what we know and what we don't know. This is the only way for travelers and businesses to take informed decisions. And obviously, no one should travel if feeling sick or having symptoms. We need to work together to keep travel safe uh, as Europe starts to uh, cross borders again. And that is why the European Commission has adopted this package of guidance and recommendations today to coordinate a safe return uh, to travel and tourism this summer. The package is built on joint uh, European uh, roadmap to, towards lifting uh, containment, and it's about coordinating, not replacing, uh, the work that is being done by businesses, by national and local governments all over Europe. We've seen all kinds of innovative ideas uh, to help uh, tourism recover. That could be phone numbers, websites like in Greece, Germany or Austria uh, that inform tourist businesses about how to operate safely, or the project in Lithuania and Slovakia that allows customers to buy, buy vouchers to support their favorite pubs and restaurants. And there are bound to be more good ideas to come. So our guidance um, doesn't try to prescribe exactly what governments and businesses should do. Instead, it's about coordinating the steps that are taken throughout Europe so that uh, travelers and workers can feel confident and safe. 
There are four vital areas that our guidance uh, addresses. Uh, this is to enable uh, tourism in a safe way this summer. Obviously, travel, border, health and vouchers. First, we need carefully uh, reopen borders uh, within Europe. So we have adopted guidance for member states on a gradual, coordinated lifting of restrictions on the free movements in Europe. Second, people need, of course, to be able to travel uh, between European countries. So we're giving guidance on how to gradually reopen transport links without risking the health of travelers or transport workers. Third, travelers and workers, they need to know that the places that tourists visit, that they are safe. Hotels, restaurants, beaches, other uh, tourist sites, they need to be run in a way that minimizes the risk of passing on the coronavirus. So, with the help of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, we put together health and safety guidance with concrete examples that explains how to operate these services in a safe way. And finally, we do not get very far if businesses like hotels and airlines, they have gone out of business. And yet, a lot of these businesses, they are feeling an intense strain. They are caught between the need to refund cancelled trips and the reality that new bookings are still very thin on ground. The starting point here is that European consumers have a right to a cash refund if that is what they want. Full stop. Many companies have come under pressure and this liquidity crunch would be less severe if customers accepted vouchers instead of cash refunds. So today we adopt recommendation on how to make these vouchers more attractive for consumers to accept. At the same time, many more companies are in a situation where liquidity is very tight. On 19th March, we adopted the temporary framework for state aid, which allows member states to provide liquidity support very quickly, very simply. And many governments now all over Europe have stepped in to help companies, also in the tourism uh, industry, to help them mitigate the crisis with uh, a lot of liquidity. Today's guidance can give a chance of a better season for the many Europeans whose livelihood depends on tourism. And, of course, for those who would like to travel this summer. But that will only work if each and every one of us do our part. In the last few weeks, we have all gotten used to the idea that the health of our whole community depends on uh, our responsible choices but also that there are different and justified recommendations in member states that we should respect. For instance, on whether and where to use face masks or how many meters is considered a safe distance between travelers and guests in restaurants. And when we begin to travel again, we need to keep that in mind, that there are differences and they are justified. To keep that in mind, we need information, and that will be my last point. And in order to have information, uh, the Commission is coordinating work with Member States to make sure that, for instance, voluntary uh, contract tracing apps work well and respect our privacy, and indeed that they will work across Europe. The Commission has also decided to set up a website with an interactive map so that Europeans have the confidence to travel, knowing what is happening in the countries that they are visiting. Of course, this is not going to be a normal summer, not for any of us. When we all work together and we all do our part in the ways the Commission uh, is setting out today, then we don't have to face a summer struck at home or a completely lost summer the European tourist industry. Thank you. Thierry?
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Margaret. Um, le 10 mars, dans cette salle, nous présentions, vous en souvenez sans doute, une nouvelle stratégie industrielle pour l'Europe. C'était trois jours avant que l'Organisation mondiale de la santé ne déclare l'Europe le nouvel épicentre de la pandémie. Deux mois plus tard, la crise du coronavirus n'a pas diminué l'importance de mettre en œuvre cette stratégie. Au contraire, elle renforce la nécessité de définir ensemble et de bâtir une économie plus verte, plus numérique, plus résiliente. Et ça vaut évidemment aussi pour le secteur du tourisme. Les recommandations que nous présentons aujourd'hui s'inscrivent bien dans la double perspective, évidemment de la gestion de la crise, c'est la vérité absolue, et aussi de la préparation pour l'avenir. You have uh, today a number of commissioners presenting uh, uh, the different elements of the package to you today, so I will try to be very brief. Millions of SMEs and family-run businesses working in accommodation, restaurants, uh, passenger transport and travel agencies risk, Margaret said, bankruptcies and job losses. That's the reality of this ecosystem. They urgently need to go back to work, and they're all willing to go back to work. And we are all urgently needing them to go back to work because our entire Europe economy depends on our ability to go back to work. At the same time, us individuals, we all need, uh, like I said, it, a break, especially after this confinement. Mm -hmm. We want to enjoy some more days. Uh, we would like to see our families uh, and friends, even if they live uh, in another region, in another country. Uh, this is the case for you and for me, Margaret. But we want to be able to do so while staying healthy and safe. Because we know that the virus will stay with us for some time. It's a difficult balance to strike. There are no simple answers. And we won't find them all today because this will be an ongoing process. Without uh, going into the details that Margaret already outlined and my colleagues will explain it, I would like just to emphasize a few points. First, we cannot prescribe when country A, for example, or B decides to open up for tourism. Member states will progressively lift border protections. This will happen gradually and not all at once. That reflects uh, the different situation, of course, in each of our countries, and we need to accept it. But second, we are helping member states and businesses to get prepared. Member states need to have sufficient capacities in terms of hospitals, testing, surveillance, contact tracing. The hospitality sector needs to know what health protocols they will uh, need to comply with and what material they will need to welcome guests. This includes, of course, very practical things like uh, cleaning and uh, disinfecting frequently to its surface, providing masks, having spare rooms for potential contaminated guests, and so on. This will, of course, reassure tourists that they are safe and they can choose their destination within the EU, knowing that they will find the same level of precaution and preparedness, and that they will not be uh, discriminated against wherever they come from in the EU, and that's very important. So, financial risk is also an element that we need to mitigate, and like I already mentioned, uh, uh, that is the logic behind our recommendation on vouchers uh, as alternative to cash reimbursement. And of course, our citizens uh, and businesses need information. That is why uh, we are uh, setting up, as Margaret said, a dedicated website with a, a map uh, combining 
real-time information related to tourism. The way job could be called, for example, reopening uh, uh, EU, because this is what we want, smoothly, what we want, reopen EU. And uh, this will also help uh, businesses draw inspirations from innovative solutions found by others. Because ultimately, to match this virus, Europe needs creativity. We have seen that innovation and responsibility among the many businesses that have converted, for example, their production lines to, produ to produce masks or ventilators. And we are starting to see that innovation among small restaurants and hotels owners, as well as towns across all over, all over, all over Europe. Beyond managing uh, what will remain a difficult 2020 some season, we need to start preparing the future. As far as all other industrial ecosystems, the recovery will have to be green, digital, and resilient. We need to work collectively, EU institutions, the industry, regions and cities, stakeholders, on how to achieve this learning from the crisis, paying particular attention to SMEs, anticipating new trends and consumer patterns related to it. Therefore, we will organize a European Tourism Convention to start designing the European Tourism of tomorrow and start preparing a roadmap uh, uh, for sustainable, innovative and resilient European tourism system. Uh, uh, in, uh, in other words, uh, a European agenda for tourism 2050. So that uh, we will emerge, hopefully, stronger from this crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you for your introductory remarks. We now move to questions. I would just like to remind everybody that for this press conference we have eight languages available, um, German, English, French, Italian, Danish, and Spanish. Uh, you can select the audio um, channel just above the video screen in front of you. And so we now move to uh, Oliver Grimm for the first question. Oliver, we give you the floor. Go ahead. Uh, do you hear me? Absolutely. Do you hear me? Hello? Super, wonderful. Hi. Oliver Grimm with the Austrian newspaper, the Presse. Short question to Vice President Vestager. You mentioned uh, the issue of uh, compensation for travelers whose uh, holidays were cancelled. We heard yesterday from your services that about 12 member states are already in breach of the current consumer protection law uh, and that there might be more member states. My question is, do you intend to start infringement procedures against these countries, against these member states? And if so, would these be uh, expedited, uh, speeded up procedures, given that this is money that is very important to families all over Europe? Uh, families that might have lost uh, their jobs in the meantime and who need basically every euro to, to get along who can't actually be satisfied with a voucher for a, for a, for a holiday they, that they probably couldn't take anyway. Thank you. Well, that is, that is exactly why we insist uh, that each citizen have a right here because we cannot judge on the economic situation of the individual. If you have lost your job, if this is your entire holiday budget uh, for, for traveling uh, that sits in, in these tickets that you cannot use anymore, then you would need to have the refund. Uh, and this is why we say this is your right, full stop. At the same time, there is a liquidity crunch. If one can afford to take a voucher or would like to support businesses by taking a voucher, well, this can be made uh, attractive. Uh, that can be that you, for instance, uh, if you don't use it within a year, that you can uh, redeem it and have cash back, that it's a very flexible voucher, that you maybe get an additional service on top of taking the voucher. There are a number of different ways uh, to do that. If, uh, if a member state wants to guarantee the voucher, uh, obviously we stand ready to, to process uh, such a scheme. Uh, as of today, we have uh, taken the Commission decision on, to this. Uh, letters will be sent uh, to the member states who are in breach of this uh, very fundamental uh, principle. So these letters, they are going off as we speak. 
Thank you. Thank you. We now move to uh, David Carreta, Radio Radicale. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you very much. David Carretta, uh, Radio Di Cali. Sorry to insist on the issue of passenger rights, because uh, you are not opening an infringement procedure, uh, uh, if my understanding is, uh, is right. Uh, you are just sending letters. So, um, in this moment, the airlines are benefiting from uh, uh, state aids. My question is quite simple. Is the liquidity problem of Ireland's company more important than the liquidity problem of households? Because that's the impression that we received from the attitude of the European Commission and some member states if the European Commission do not, do, does not act immediately on that issue. Une deuxième question pour euh, le commissaire Breton à propos des, des frontières. Euh, il n'y a pas de recommandation scientifique du Centre européen de contrôle et prévention sur le maintien des contrôles aux frontières ou les frontières fermées, parce qu'en fait elles sont fermées. Euh, et, et là, vous, au début, vous avez dit qu'il ne faut pas fermer les frontières et maintenant vous dites qu'il faut les ouvrir tout doucement, euh, progressivement, etc. Mais sur quelle base scientifique vous dites ça Pourquoi vous dites pas simplement que les frontières ne sont pas utiles pour combattre le virus Merci. Well, on, on the first question, I'm terribly sorry that was uh, unclear. Uh, what is starting now is the first step uh, in the infringement procedure. It is always so that the first thing we do is that we send a letter to say, well, you're not in agreement with European legislation. And then, of course, we expect member states to correct it uh, immediately. Otherwise, next steps will be taken. Thank you. On the border, of course, on the borders, uh, uh, you will have a precise explanation on, 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 on the policy uh, that we will have, the protocols that we will present uh, with our colleagues, uh, Ilva uh, Johansson, in, in a few minutes. But, but uh, you know, uh, uh, first, uh, uh, we need to understand uh, that, uh, of course, we have the borders, and uh, 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 restriction on travel should first be lifted uh, in areas with a uh, continuously improving epidemiological situation and where sufficient capabilities are in place in terms of hospitals, as I said, testing, surveillance and contact tracing capacities. And this is the first priority. And this is, of course, a decision of the health authorities, which are run, as you know, by member states. But secondly, and of course, we will try, of course, as we said, to, uh, um, uh, to, uh, to coordinate uh, all this and my colleagues will be much more uh, uh, vocal on, on this. But the second thing I wanted to mention is obviously uh, um, you're right, in a sense. Uh, there is uh, no border for the virus. And uh, this is why uh, we will always prefer to see zones, areas, regions, where, of course, you, will, you may see an evolution or different evolution of the pandemics and then, of course, to treat these regions the way that should be treated. And this is, of course, what we will recommend more and more, to look at regions instead of looking at countries. But, I repeat, decision in both cases will have been taken by local health authorities. Merci beaucoup. Nous passons maintenant à l'OTE. I'm not sure to pronounce the family name correctly. I think it's Danish. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Lotte. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll take the chance and ask the question in Danish uh, for Margrethe Vestager. Uh, Margrethe, to the land you yourself know best, Danmark, som har øh, forholdsvis fine coronatal, øh, og andre lande står i samme situation. Din anbefaling der er til et land som Danmark, at man åbner grænserne så hurtigt som overhovedet muligt. Og vil din anbefaling er, at man åbner grænserne først til nabolande, eller kunne det for eksempel også være til andre lande, der ligger længere væk? For eksempel Grækenland, som også har forholdsvis øh, fine coronatal. 
Uh, tusind tak, uh, Lotte. Uh, det er ikke min anbefaling, det er kommissionens samlede anbefaling. Vi har drøftet det i det på kommissionens møde, og, uh, og det er, vores anbefaling er, at grænserne de bliver åbnet. Uh, som uh, Thierry Breton lige sagde, jamen, så kan der være ting, hvor man skal sige, at vi bliver nød, selvfølgelig nødt til at have kapacitet. Uh, vi skal have vores sundhedsprotokoller på plads, så vi ned, ved, hvordan vi gør. Men, men vores anbefaling er, at grænserne bliver løftet uh, for lande, der har et nogenlunde ensartet uh, tryk, hvor man uh, kan forsvare det sundhedsmæssigt. Uh, og så vidt jeg husker, uh, helt tilbage, at grænserne blev lukket, så sagde også de danske sundhedsmyndigheder, at det ikke er et sundhedsmæssigt begrundelse, uh, der holder grænserne uh, lukket. Så vi håber selvfølgelig, at de bliver åbnet hurtigst muligt, fordi det er en fundamental ting for europæere, at man kan, har fri bevægelighed på tværs af grænser. Thank you very much. We now move to Dio Velasquez. Uh, are you hearing me? Not only do we hear you, we see you, Diego. Ah, perfect, perfect. Uh, oui, merci beaucoup. Um, C'est Diego Velasquez, Luxembourg Avort. Une question pour Monsieur Breton. Um, dans votre communication et dans vos pans, on voit surtout que on s'occupe du tourisme. Or, on... Ce qui me manque un peu, c'est euh, la dimension pour les régions transfrontalières qui, depuis deux mois, souffrent de la fermeture des frontières, des familles qui ne savent pas s'ils peuvent voir leurs proches, des, euh, des travailleurs qui se font contourner tous les jours. Et là, je me demandais pourquoi ne pas avoir insisté plus là-dessus, parce que c'est surtout là où deux régions euh, similaires d'un point de vue épidémiologique sont coupées l'une de l'autre, qui ont besoin l'une de l'autre. Euh, à, au rythme quotidien sont les plus affectés et pourquoi ne pas avoir insisté plus sur cet élément ci euh, de la dimension transfrontalière européenne Merci beaucoup. Oui, c'est une question évidemment importante et qui dépasse euh, bien entendu le cadre du tourisme. Hein. Donc aujourd'hui on parle évidemment du tourisme et ce n'est pas du tout pour euh, euh, éluder la question que vous posez qui est absolument essentielle et qui nécessite effectivement d'abord des accords bilatéraux entre les États membres eux-mêmes. Et je peux vous dire que je sais que beaucoup de discussions ont lieu en ce moment avec les chefs d'État et de gouvernement concernés par les pays dont vous parlez et dont certains que je connais bien. Donc c'est un sujet qui est un sujet essentiel pour les travailleurs frontaliers. Euh, euh, et, et voyez du reste que les choses, euh, objectivement, sont en train de s'améliorer euh, assez rapidement sur cette question, spécifiquement pour les, les travailleurs frontaliers. Mais si vous le voulez, c'est un, un autre sujet. Donc en ce qui nous concerne, nous avons voulu avoir une vision globale pour le tourisme et uniquement pour le tourisme. Euh, on, on, on saura vous parler évidemment euh, de cette question plus en détail, parce qu'encore encore une fois, une vision quasiment en temps réel et au jour le jour de ce qui se passe, je peux vous dire que les choses s'améliorent et je pense qu'elles vont s'améliorer dans les, dans les semaines qui viennent pour régler ce problème qui est un problème important pour le redémarrage du marché intérieur. Merci. Et pour rappel, Diego, euh, la Commission a fait toute une série de propositions en ce qui concerne la levée des mesures de confinement, euh, le euh, passage des frontières pour les travailleurs transfrontaliers, etc. Le paquet qui est adopté aujourd'hui concerne spécifiquement l'activité touristique, mais ça ne veut pas dire que nous ne sommes pas occupés des autres dimensions du problème. Nous passons maintenant à Thomas Millerina. Thank you very much, Thomas Miglierina, Swiss Television. Some people like to go on holiday because of crowds. And some regions of uh, uh, Europe, certain beaches, certain islands, they actually cater to this kind of people who like big crowds. Now, I don't mean to criticize, but I was reading your documents, and halfway through it, I, my uh, I, uh, will to go on holiday was lost if I was this kind of, uh, of person. So I wonder whether you're considering this kind of uh, uh, psychological impact, especially for, uh, for this kind of tourism, if you have something uh, to say to this. Well, well you actually, first and foremost, you're welcome to criticize, um, so, so don't feel sorry about that. Uh, but I think you're right to say that if you travel for crowds, this will be a very difficult summer. 
uh, I think still in every member state, they would say only so many people can come together until end of uh, maybe August. Uh, you shouldn't have uh, big gatherings. Uh, actually, we also recommend that technology is used in order to enable people to see how to process, for instance, to a, a, a museum in a safe way, to buy your tickets beforehand so you don't have to queue at a counter, uh, that your tickets can be uh, processed uh, without a, uh, uh, a professional at a museum having to come close to you, so that you have your booked entry in order to avoid uh, crowds, and that that kind of systems can be used in numerous uh, different places in order to be able to respect uh, distance uh, between people. Uh, so uh, I, think, I think you're right. If, if you travel for crowds, this will be a difficult summer. Nothing, Brad. It was very well said. Um, um, we need to understand, and know that you know that extremely well, uh, uh, the crisis is not over. We are just lifting now a little bit more our freedom, quote unquote, but we need to continue to live with the virus. So, yes, Mark said it very well. This will be a, a summer like the others, but we hope it will be the last one this way. Okay, thank you very much. We now move to Daniel Weber. Uh, yes, hello. Um, Daniel Weber from the Luxembourgish Public Radio. 100.7. I have a follow-up uh, to that uh, question in maybe a more general way. I'd like to know, uh, what's the Commission's general position on closing borders in order to fight a virus like uh, corona? Um, that's my first question, and uh, I have a second one on discrimination. The Commission has uh, been underlying that EU citizens should not be discriminated. If I understand your recommendation well, this could be the case, though, that uh, a citizen of a country is allowed to enter another member state, but another citizen uh, from another country is not allowed to do so. So how, how is this not discriminatory? Thank you. Uh, first and, and, and foremost, our colleague uh, Ilva Johansson, who has worked with, with borders now for a very long time and who has the interaction uh, with the relevant ministers, she will be here shortly uh, just to say that she will give you every detail. Um, but the, the point to say here is that if, if you open the border, well, it shouldn't be just for some passport holders and not for other passport holders. Because you can have, you know, completely uh, legitimate reasons uh, to be in a country. Uh, you can uh, work there, you can have your family there. You have stayed there for a very long time, even though you do not have the passport of the country. And then when borders lifted, well, you should not be prevented from going. And as Shirid mentioned, uh, the virus doesn't really respect the national borders that were created by wars uh, in previous centuries. Uh, the virus uh, travels with people if we do not do as we're supposed to do, sanitize, keep a distance, that we're prudent. Uh, and this is much more important for, for people to understand. You see the, the approach in France with red and, and green zones. You see in other countries, larger cr countries, where regions have, uh, have had a, a very, very awful situation uh, with virus, and other parts of the country has not been hit uh, at all. So, so that is, I think that is the important balance to be kept here, uh, that you sp should be specific about the virus and not about the old borders. And the Commission has been consistent in, in our guidance to member states to say, well, borders uh, should be uh, lifted for, for workers, uh, for, for travelers, uh, while at the same time, obviously, uh, the safety and the health of people uh, being uh, the first and foremost concern. Thank you. Uh, we now move to Mark Peppercorn. Yes, good afternoon, Mark Peppercorn, first time. Um, Mrs. Petager, you stress a lot the, the principle of non-discrimination about lifting the borders, the border control, sorry. Uh, but what can and will the Commission do when Member State simply does, does this discriminate? 
I mean, especially because an uh, infringement procedure will take two years on average. So this does look to me a very uh, viable solution. Thanks. Well, I, I really do not mean to, to escape the question, but I don't think that it's fair when my colleague is coming here who will have to, to take the, the precise decision, this, decisions uh, on what to do on these issues. And, and Ilma will be here, in, yeah, depending on the number of questions, but very, very shortly. Indeed. Uh, you will have ample opportunity. I see that there are many, many hands raised to ask specific questions on the, on the guidelines and the different aspects, including vouchers, consumer rights, in the second press conference. Let's see if we have a, a certain number of questions, perhaps more on the economic dimension of this. Uh, I move to uh, Susanna Francis. Um. Uh, thank you, but I still have a question on uh, vouchers, actually. Uh, I would like to understand, sorry, <laughs> if a company um, uh, decides that it, it will only uh, give its money back to, to, to a customer, and to, for instance, in two years' time, is, is it still uh, okay? Uh, that's, that's my concrete question. And uh, you're saying that, of course, we cannot have uh, crowds, but should we expect crowds inside planes? Because we don't see here, um, uh, or at least I don't see here, a clear recommendation for empty seats. So I'd like to, to understand for uh, aviation what is uh, your uh, recommendation. And just one last question, because we saw uh, Greece suggesting that, suggesting that um, actually uh, passengers uh, or tourists should take... Um, should be tested 74 hours earlier uh, the traveling and we don't see any kind of uh, recommendation in this sense so this is something that for the commission is totally not feasible thank you well let me give you a short answers just as a precursor uh, to my colleagues who will be coming here uh, first, in, in two years' time, that is, that is not what is supposed to happen if you want to have your uh, money back when you have the right to get your money back. Uh, that's the first thing. Second, uh, on airlines, uh, we give uh, the guidance as to how, from a health point of view, that you can still fly safely, uh, where you cannot um, observe distance, that you then use uh, different kinds of uh, protective equipment, masks in, in particular, uh, and, of course, that you use the ventilating system uh, to its uh, utmost use. Uh, on the question of, of testing uh, for at borders, uh, where uh, what we have learned uh, from the health professionals uh, in this case is that you do not have uh, uh, sort of uh, evidence to, to say that this is a secure way to know that people may not have been uh, infected or have not been infected after uh, they have taken the test, uh, which is why it's not part of our recommendations. Thank you. We will take two last questions before moving on to the next press conference. Uh, je passe la parole à Christian Spielmann. Oui, bonjour. Euh, ma question pour M. Breton euh, sur l'ouverture le, le, des frontières et euh, plus spécifiquement sur la France. Je sais qu'aucune décision n'a encore été prise par le gouvernement français qui doit se prendre le 15 juin, mais on sait que traditionnellement, en juillet et en août, on a des grandes transhumances. Alors, il se trouve que la France est un pays avec sept frontières, qu'elle est traversée de par, euh, de par, euh, du nord au sud, beaucoup de, 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 de gens du nord voyage en voiture pour gagner l'Espagne, le Portugal, l'Italie. Euh, et on sait que la situation épidémiologique en France est très distincte. C'est-à-dire qu'en fait, on a deux zones très touchées, qui sont le Grand Est et la région parisienne. Si jamais la France devait retarder euh, l'ouverture de ses frontières, justement à cause de cette situation épidémiologique, est-ce qu'on peut envisager des contournements Est-ce qu'il faut attendre que l'on ouvre totalement toutes les frontières, ou est-ce qu'on peut imaginer simplement bloquer, réserver avec certaines régions Comment est-ce qu'on peut imaginer cette mécanique d'ouverture de frontières avec un pays qui a ses spécificités Et ma deuxième question est plus précise pour Mme Vestager. Euh, J'avoue franchement que je serais très intéressé de pouvoir aller visiter une exposition en Suisse qui va terminer la fin du mois de juillet. Donc on est à la fin du juillet, on est en mai. Je voudrais savoir si je peux faire la réservation en toute tranquillité ou s'il vaut mieux que j'attende les derniers moments. Merci. Je vais, je, vais, je, je vais répondre à la première question. Je pourrais presque aussi répondre à la seconde, mais je laisserai Mme Stager. Parce que, euh, 
sur la première, euh, vous avez raison, la, la, la France est un, est un des grands pays euh, touristiques euh, de l'Union européenne, mais pas uniquement, évidemment. Euh, et, et, et la France euh, accueille beaucoup de touristes qui euh, ne sont pas des citoyens français ou des résidents français. Euh, la France est plus souvent traversée, notamment pour aller par exemple en Espagne, qui est un deuxième grand pays touristique, même le premier de d'Europe euh, euh, depuis euh, il y a deux ans. Euh, euh, vous avez vu du reste que euh, la décision des autorités euh, espagnoles, selon les recommandations des autorités de santé, et j'insiste là-dessus, aujourd'hui, c'est que lorsque euh, un voyageur, un touriste euh, 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 arrive en Espagne, il doit être euh, euh, mis en quarantaine, pardon, quinzaine, pendant quinze jours, dans un endroit spécifique. Euh, avec évidemment la désignation du lieu où il se trouve, et ce pendant un jour. C'est comme ça aujourd'hui. Euh, je ne sais pas si ce sera le cas euh, cet été, mais c'est le cas aujourd'hui. Vous avez vu en, en revanche que la France semble indiquer, et vous avez déjà vu ça puisque vous suivez évidemment ces sujets, que euh, euh, en ce qui concerne l'accueil des euh, résidents euh, non français euh, qui voudraient venir en France, il n'y a pas cette euh, demande qui est euh, demandée par exemple par les autorités euh, espagnoles. Donc encore une fois, euh, cela dépend évidemment des euh, situations épidémiologiques donc, de chacun des États membres. Donc euh, aujourd'hui, euh, il est absolument, on ne peut pas répondre à votre question, il va falloir suivre évidemment tout ça de façon... Euh, C'est pour ça que je disais que c'était, dans ma présentation initiale, c'est un « ongoing process ». Bien sûr, aujourd'hui, on vous présente des protocoles, on vous présente des recommandations qui ont été faites avec de, après de très nombreuses, de multiples interactions avec tous les États membres, avec tous les acteurs du monde du tourisme. Mais nous savons que ces protocoles vont progressivement évoluer, s'adapter. C'est comme ça qu'il faut comprendre, évidemment, euh, euh, ce que nous présentons aujourd'hui. Donc, euh, euh, la, 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 la réponse à votre question, c'est que sur France, comme vous l'avez vu, il n'y a pas de restriction quand vous êtes un citoyen qui, du reste, ne dépend pas uniquement de l'Union européenne, mais aussi de Schengen. Comme vous le savez, c'est la position y compris donc pour les Suisses. Donc, euh, vous pourrez venir en, 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 en France sans cette obligation de, 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 de quarantaine. Enfin, D'autres pays l'imposent encore. Donc, euh, voilà ce qu'on peut dire aujourd'hui sur cette question. Je laisse la deuxième question beaucoup plus difficile, la réponse, parce que alors là, euh, à Madame Vestager, euh, Madame euh, l'exécutive vice-présidente, mais elle est là aussi pour l'élection difficile. <rire> well, that, that is obviously one of the most uh, difficult questions, and those who seems to be the easiest one, because I don't know the answer to your question, uh, because I don't know what they are uh, thinking and planning in, in Switzerland. Um, two perspectives. Uh, one is, of course, that a lot of uh, museums either prolong uh, their sh exhibitions or they postpone the opening of exhibitions. I myself uh, happily took a, a, a voucher uh, to be able to come back to Paris to see the big exhibition Grand Palais on Pompeii, uh, because obviously that couldn't open and we couldn't come uh, during the confinement. So you could hope that they would uh, do that in Switzerland. And the second perspective is, uh, of course, that some of us may not be able to go to the shows that we wanted to see, the exhibitions that ran out, and we can go there. I think much more important is to recognize all the many people who now see businesses that they have built over decades just crumble. And this is, of course, why we have this drive to say if it can be done safely, if each and one of us ourselves can take an informed decision as to whether we will travel or not, well, then we should do it. But we all take a risk. We do our utmost to minimize that risk. We see how governments, businesses, regional governments, they do their best uh, to minimize the risk, to make sure that we can travel healthy uh, and safely. But we all have to take our own informed decision. And uh, I myself very much hope we will open up. Uh, I had the same discussion, I think, as many of you have over the dining tables. Can we go this summer? Where can we go this summer? Because after this confinement, we need a break. And all the many, many people working in tourism, they are eager to welcome us back. Thank you very much. We'll take one last question uh, from Veronica Phillips from ORF. Veronica, press your microphone. 
Ah, you have muted on your side. Okay. Then, if that's not, if that doesn't work, we will take one last question from uh, Paola. Paola Tama. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Go ahead, Paola. Hi, thank you. My question is for Vice President Vassiger. To which questions has, to which countries has a letter of formal notice been sent of infringement of passenger rights, please? Oh, I am sorry. I should have brought that list. Uh, I don't know. We can provide you with, uh, with information uh, about this, uh, this question uh, after this uh, press conference. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you to both our members of the college uh, for their presence today. We now move to the second uh, press conference, so stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you.